Thank you for attending the Commuted Film Screening and Discussion. The event is part of the Understanding Drug Sentencing Symposium organized by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law and the Academy for Justice at Arizona State University Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law with help from Professor Mark Osler at University of St. Thomas Law School and Dean Jelani Jefferson Exum at University of Detroit Mercy Law School. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the event today, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video non participants. Second, we want to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. Third, please note that auto-generated transcription has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the automated transcription or to hide it, click live transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event includes an exclusive screening of an unreleased feature documentary. Attendees are not permitted to record or distribute any unauthorized recordings of the film shared today. Note though that the event is being recorded uh, by us and it will be edited uh, and made available on the event page and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the event. Jelani? Thank you so much, Holly. And um, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for this part of the symposium, the film screening and panel discussion. I would like to thank Professor Doug Berman and the Ohio State Drug Enforcement and Policy Center for inviting me to be one of the organizers of this event to help to plan it, along with the Arizona State Academy for Justice and Professor and Deputy Director of the Academy, Buena Beatty, um, as well as, as you heard, Professor Mark, Mark Osler from the University of St. Thomas Law School. So it's been great to be a part of the planning committee for this event. It's been a really fantastic symposium, and um, I'm just really excited about this part of it. We are the um, last event on the agenda today, but please remember to visit the, the um, symposium website so that you can get the agenda for tomorrow and um, you're able to register for the rest of the symposium. And then of course, um, as you already heard, there will be recordings of this. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Danielle and Naila, you can, you can turn on your cameras if you like and um, as our guests today. So this evening, we will watch a portion of the upcoming documentary, Commuted. Um, this that will be followed by a discussion with the um, main subject of the documentary, Danielle Metz, and the filmmaker, the director, Naila Jefferson, who also happens to be my sister. So I'm really happy to be able to do this. Um, in this film, viewers will learn about Danielle, who in 1993, as a first time nonviolent offender, was sentenced to a triple life plus 20 year term. In 2016, she was granted clemency by President Obama. Now Danielle is looking to just really make meaning of her life um, and the life portions of her life that she lost to fulfill her dream and um, to unite her family. So let me tell you a little bit more about Danielle and also about Naila before we turn to the film. Naila, Naila Jefferson, my sister, as I told you, she is a filmmaker based in New Orleans whose acclaimed work has been distributed domestically and internationally on the film festival circuit, theatrically and also televised. Her debut documentary, Vanishing Pearls, The Oystermen of Point of Wahash, told the story of the little known African-American oyster fishing community in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, and their fight for justice in the aftermath of the 2010 BP oil spill. In 2017, Naila was nominated for a National Magazine Ellie Award for directing Essence Magazine's Black Girl Magic episode four. Naila's first narrative film, Plaquemines, was chosen as an American Black Film Festival HBO Shorts finalist and is currently available on HBO platforms. Naila's current work includes the recent short Descended from the Promised Land about the Tulsa massacre, currently touring festivals, a documentary and production about Danielle Luna, the first Black international supermodel, and of course, Commuted, which is in post-production. Then let me also tell you about Danielle Metz. So Danielle Metz is from New Orleans and was a 26-year-old mother of two when she was convicted as part of her abusive husband's drug ring, sentenced to three life sentences plus 20 years in federal prison. When her sentence was commuted by the Obama administration in 2016, 
She got a rare chance to regain life, the life and family that she'd been dreaming about in prison. But back home in New Orleans, she steps into a different reality. For the past five years, Naila and a commuted, commuted documentary team have been working with Danielle, following her as she works to rebuild her life and legacy after 23 years of incarceration. Today, Danielle is an advocate for the incarcerated and for those transitioning home. Through her work with the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, Voice of the Experienced and the Formerly Incarcerated Transitions Clinic in New Orleans. She's an, also an undergraduate at Southern University of New Orleans and a grandmother of two. So I am so excited to be able to share a bit of this film with you all, not just because, as I've said a few times now, Naila is my sister and I'm so proud of her and her accomplishments, but because this is really just such an important story to tell. It's an important and inspiring story and one that raises awareness of the true destructive impacts of our drug sentencing laws and policies. And I'm so grateful to Danielle for allowing her story to be told and for being here to talk to us today about her journey. Um, just to let you all know, this film is, what you're gonna see um, is a work in progress. So the film is still in production and you're gonna see a few selected excerpts of the film. So think of it as a sneak preview of sorts. Um, and so with that, let's now get to our main feature, Commuted. But I hope that with what you saw, you were able to get a sense of um, at least the beginning of Danielle's story, you get some of the, the turbulence um, that it caused her family and how she really was focused on you know, thinking about how to talk to her children about this and what this would really mean for her life. And so, um, so we'll turn to our panel discussion. Um, I have a few prepared questions, but um, I encourage folks out there in the audience to also put your questions in the, um, in the Q&A function, and we can um, have some discussions uh, that way. I'll, I'll pull from that to have some questions for you all. So um, let me start by first, you know, well, again, I guess, thanking Danielle for sharing her story. And um, I wish you could have seen a little bit more, but I think it, I think folks got a, a, enough of a flavor there of what you went through um, to at least get an idea to set the context for this discussion. So Danielle, I wanted to start by asking you a question. Can you talk to us about why it was important to you to even share your story? Because I could imagine that, you know, after going through all that you went through, it would have been easy to come home and just, you know, work on yourself and your, your own, um, putting your own life together and not also have other people see and um, you know, sort of share. So can you tell us why you thought it was important and what you hope people will take away um, once they're able to see the full film? I think it was important for me to share my story because I think we all can agree that um, the justice system has filled us with mass incarceration and to shade a light on um, the importance of this issue because I left so many women behind. And um, without clemency, the women would perish because most of them has exhausted all their appeals. And um, I know what it feels like to be on that side of the fence. So I just think that um, it's more important for me because uh, of the clemency issue, because um, when our present president, current president was talking about um, you know, when he was on the campaign trail, he was saying that he was going to um, cut the prison population. He can cut it in half. And we haven't seen that. And um, they have the tool to use, which is executive clemency, the governors in the prison, in the president. And um, I don't want them to wait until after their term is over to start utilizing it. I want I, I would hope that they were doing it, do it going in. So that's why it's important to me, because they have over a. Uh, a million and something, millions and millions of people, 220,000 women are incarcerated at this time. And um, most of them are mothers, daughters, sisters, and really the pillar of the community and they are, have been removed. So that's why it's important for me. Thank you, thank you. So you're thinking about the, the women that you left behind um, when you got this, this, this real um, kind of answer prayer of clemency and in the, in the discussions that we've been having today in the symposium, uh, the audience has gotten to hear about, um, really from some other folks who've also been incarcerated, who have um, had their sentences commuted and had similar feelings that you know they couldn't just 
walk out into life without thinking about everybody else who was still um, still affected. So thank you for that. Um, Naila, I want to ask you a similar question before I get into some more of the details from the film. So for you, you know, you don't have a legal background. Um, you know, I know that you were working on other projects. What brought you to this project and what sort of captured you about it and made you say, you know, okay, this is something that I really want to spend time working on and getting out there? Um, well, first, thanks for having me. I'm really excited that we got to show a little bit. I'm sorry that it wasn't as much as we hoped to share, but I guess that'll just build the, the mystery, right? Um, but Danielle and I were actually introduced uh, at a church service. And feel free to jump in, Danielle, if I get any details of the story wrong. But I, I actually got a call from Bishop Love. I don't know if you got the same call. Uh, but we both attend the City of Love in New Orleans. And Bishop Love called me and he said, do you know Danielle Metz? And I said, no. And he was like, well... I think she has a story that needs to be told. Um, I don't know the, the the call that Bishop gave Danielle, but maybe it was something like that. Do you know Neil? I don't know. But uh, we met one early uh, Sunday morning because Danielle was attending eight o'clock service and I only attended 1030. So I woke up early and we got to meet um, and we had a brief conversation. And I think like any filmmaker, when you meet someone like Dan Danielle, who's uh, very dynamic, very charismatic, um, but then also has a story that needs to be told. You kind of want to jump in. But as I've learned through this process over five years, you can't, you can't just do that. Um, and so I think over time, and it hasn't always been a smooth road, but I think it's been a necessary road. Um, we've got to know each other. We've got to learn each other. We've gotten to trust each other. And I think what we've put together is a really personal film and that's what it needed to be. If I didn't, if it didn't take all this time to really get to know Danielle, it would have just been a story that was more surface and maybe something that was more about um, what happened back then, less so than what da Danielle is doing right now and all the progress that she's making and the healing that her family is experiencing and um, in the work that she's doing right now to really help women uh, get clemency as well. And so that's what I wanted to uplift with this project. And really it's been a journey. I didn't know in the beginning. Um, and I think that's for a lot of filmmakers, you, you, you think you're going to highlight one thing and it becomes something else. And that's what this film has been. So we really wanted to focus um, on the familial impacts of long-term incarceration. And fortunately, we've been able to not only talk to Danielle, but also her children, Carl and Glenisha. And as you heard in uh, the 411 scene, they were seven and three when um, Danielle went away. Um, and then 23, 23 years later, they're 30 and what is that, 27? 30 and 27. And so they're full grown adults when their mom comes home and we get to see them try to rebuild their relationship. Um, and again, just a thank you to Danielle because I know it hasn't been an easy process, but thank you for allowing us in. And um, I, I consider it a real honor to be able to tell the story. Thank you for that. We are starting to get a few questions um, in the Q&A, but I'm going to ask one more of my own before I turn there. And this is for Danielle. So um, Danielle, this has been an entire day of, um, of the symposium where audiences learn different things about um, drug sentencing and, and its impact on mass incarceration. And in our first panel session today, it was focused on mandatory minimum sentencing. And I know um, you ended up getting a triple life sentence plus 20 years. And so um, I know that mandatory minimums um, played a role in that. But I just wanna know how much did you know during your trial and during your case, how much did you know and understand about the sentencing, um, the possible sentencing outcomes? What, was this something that you were shocked to hear? Um, I just take us through how that was for you and, and what you came to understand and when you came to understand it. Well, during my trial, I didn't know anything about mandatory minimums. and. Um... My lawyer, the lawyer that I had, he had never represented a criminal case before. I later learned that after I had got convicted and, you know, I was on my way to sentence. And that's when I found out that he had never, you know, tried a criminal case before. So he never told me that, um, like career criminal enterprise, one of the offenses that I had, that it carried a life sentence no matter what. It was no 22 life. He never told me that. And he led me in my mind because we never set up a strategy. I thought that a lawyer comes and set up a strategy. You know, you can have your defense and this is what we're going to fight with. I only saw him the day before I began to go to trial. 
And at that time, that is when he told me that um, my mother's sister was going to testify against me. And he still didn't say, well, hey, if you get found guilty, you're going to automatically get a, get a life sentence. So I'm thinking that the worst case scenario would be that if I am found guilty, I would at least get probation. And um, if I had to do 20 years probation, that would have been easy for me because I know after that one time with the law, I wasn't going to do anything else because, you know, I had gambled with too much already. And so I was asking him, I said, um, afterwards, after they did my pre-sentencing investigation, that is what happens when the prosecutor come in and design your case. I asked, I said, why can't I just get probation? And she was like, I don't think you know the severity of what you know, these charges. I say, but I've never been to prison before. So up until then, I never know anything about mandatory minimums. And um, the, the sentencing guideline itself, when I went back afterwards and I started looking at the sentencing guidelines, I, I saw in category one, I had never had an offense. So I figured, why didn't I get 60 months? And, you know, at the most, that would have been the most in category one for people who don't have prior offenses, but that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know the um, folks who are out there watching, they haven't seen the full film, and so they don't know the basis of the charges. They don't have that all that context. Um, so these were, you know, there were drug offenses. It dealt with um, a drug ring much bigger than you that you had some minor um, interaction with, but that ultimately you were a, a no violence on your part, um, first time offenders. So that's what she's saying, that she didn't have any kind of prior criminal history. And so um, was that the basis of why you were thinking this must be something that would be probation only? Yes, that, that is why I was thinking it, because even at the sentencing, I still asked the judge, I said, uh, can you consider my kids or take that into account that I have, I'm the mother of two kids, you know, I don't have any prior offenses. And it, it was just talk for me because lip service, because he didn't pay that any mind. And then at the same time, I'm sure, you know, with the guidelines, he had the guidelines to go by as well. But then he had told me um, that I had forfeited my right to live in a civilized society. And um, those were the words that, them words I would never forget, but those, those words I would wake up to for 23 years. I, I couldn't get the thought of him telling me that out my head because I was like, you don't have any young woman related to you? Nobody in your family have ever done anything wrong before, you, you know, wrong before? You know, and I just couldn't understand it. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn to some of the questions that are in the chat. They're also for you, Danielle. I mean, Nate, I have some questions for you that I'll come back to. But um, so one of the questions is, Danielle, how do you encourage the women who are still incarcerated? How I encourage them, I always tell them that, um, well, I am a living example, a living witness, a living testament that, to what can happen. I was the last person that President Obama granted clemency to. And every time those lists came out, I was just, couldn't believe that my name was not on it. So with that being said, I would always tell them where there's life, there's hope. It doesn't mean that even after, you know, you, your appeal is, all you have exhausted all your appeals, it doesn't mean that something wouldn't happen for you. Once, you know, if you have breath, as long as you wake up, anything could change. And I tell them, for one, I encourage them to tell them, keep on fighting, you know, tell your story, because a lot of women have been through a lot of traumatic experiences that they never talked about. And that is how they find themselves in prison today, because th those are unaddressed trauma issues that they're never addressing. Once you're inside prison, you're incarcerated, you don't get any treatment. I've never talked to a therapist or anyone about what I was going through in there. In fact, when we were going through the video, one of those pictures with my mother and my daughter there, that was a very hard time for me right there. And um, I was very thin, very frail. My hair was all flipped up. Um, I don't know what it was. Even my shoes looked like dust shoes. And when I came to the visitor, I was like, what, else, what is going on with me? But it was hard. So a lot of times when I was going through whatever I was going through, uh, it was getting hard for me. I would sometimes just shave off all my hair. And that was me trying to put a voice to what I was going through. But no one ever paid attention. You would have people say, why did you cut off all your hair? Girl, why you cut it? I'm, I was hurting in the inside, but I didn't know how to connect my feelings with what I was going through. So I would just do things to make people just at least know, hey, pay attention to me. I need help. It's not as easy for me in this moment. You know, because a lot of times when you're incarcerated, you don't want your family to be worried about you. So I would never tell my mother that, hey, I'm having a hard time because I know already that she's 
going through it herself. She's in prison as well. So that was very hard for me it's a lot of times. And it's more, it's, you know, like we don't get help on the inside. Mm -hmm. We don't get the help that we need. I feel like a woman, 26 years old, sentenced to three life sentences plus 20 years. It should have been mandated that I have some kind of treatment, something while I was going to be there. And of course, I became the custody of the BOP. So why not help me while I'm there? They didn't even allow me to get an education. So I just tell them, be encouraged. Thank you. I um, have a question for you, but I'm going to give you a, a chance to catch your breath. And let me, because um, I know this is a, it's a difficult topic. And so let me turn to Naila and ask her a question. And then I'll, um, then I'll come back. Um, so Naila, what's something important that you learned during the, just the making of this film about our criminal justice system? Like, just tell us about something that made a big impact on you. Um, I, I, one of the most shocking um, details that I learned is something Danielle just talked about, um, that she had no idea kind of what she was up against. And um, she had no idea that the, these were the charges and these were the possible, this was the possible sentence that she faced. Um, and you just think about other young black women, black men, um, you know, walking into those courtrooms and not realizing the odds that are against them. Uh, that'll really impact your decision making. And so, you know, Danielle told me that story. And then she tells me the story about the work starts when you get in prison and you try to have to fight your way out of it. Um, and I mean, you're already there, you're up against, you're up against the federal government. I mean, they're throwing, they throw everything into the cases that they have. So, I mean, it's an uphill battle and one that so many people don't fight, um, don't win in order to try and get their freedom. Um, that for me was just really eye-opening when you think about what's going on in the justice system and, and the inner workings um, and how, how we wind up where we are. Um, but I'll say one thing that was really encouraging is that Danielle would tell me about the sisterhood that, um, that she had in, in prison. And a lot of those women lifted her up every day and told her that she would go home and um, helped her to feel encouraged to get an education, even though um, on the inside, they were telling her that it didn't make sense because she was a lifer. Um, and so I think with this film, we really just want to kind of go against the traditional stories that you hear about incarceration and talk about the human element that we all lose that I think has been lost um, when you think about sentencing when you think about our criminal justice system i don't know when exactly it happened or why but we really lost a sense of 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 the people and the ripple effects of what happens when we um when we hand down these lengthy sentences especially to mothers mothers of young children um and as danielle tells me that's what th those were a lot of ahead of you re-entering um home and family so what was how has that been it is, it's been a, still a challenge for me because I still have to get reacquainted with my kids. Although I know that I'm their mother, I have been out of their life, well, in a physical sense for 23 years. And sometimes even with me going, doing my day-to-day -day activities, it's easy for you because my kids are all grown now. My daughter, she's married, she has a family. My son, he has a family and you know, for some reason, when I thought I got released, that they were going to leave, you know, there was, my daughter was married, but I thought they was going to drop everything and want to be with me, but life had moved on. So I, I expected that, but that is not what happened. So even now, some days I'm here, you know, my mom not here anymore. I don't know if um, Naila told you, but my mother, seven months after I came home, my mom died. So that, that's been a big old transition for me. And it's easy for me when I'm not doing stuff or moving around for me to slip into like a place of loneliness, a place of emptiness, because I've, I've missed out on so much. And when I visit my friends, you know, when I go by one of my friends' house and I'm hearing her telling her son, he better have the room clean when he get home and he better bring out the trash. I didn't get to experience that. So it's like, it has me like, really emotional and balanced just listening to it all you know so it's still a challenge so 
I'm still getting to know getting um to know my kids and getting reacquainted with them. So it's still an everyday ba- uh, everyday thing. And um I was telling myself just the other night I said sometimes I think I'm not just that happy. I'm happy to be free, but then I have an obligation to those that I left behind. I feel like I do because they are depending on someone to come out and um just be their voice. And that 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 is what I chose to do for them. And so I was just saying, you know, it's going to take me 23 years, I think, to get back to normal, you know, just to where I was when I first left, because, you know, prison is about survival. You know, some stories you have, we probably would never hear. Because yeah. Yeah. prison is of a, a world in of itself. Yeah. Can you, um, in that, and thank you for sharing that, Neil, I'm sorry if you had anything you want to add, just jump in. Um, so you're transitioning back home and it's a work in progress, but you really have really um, committed yourself to being a voice for incarcerated women, to, to um, be an advocate for change. So can you tell us about the current work that you're doing, Danielle? Um, I am a community health worker for formerly incarcerated people that comes back into society that needs medical attention. So most of the women or men are from this area. And like, just say for instance, the men that are in prison, most of them have been in there like 44 years or 54 years and they're just getting back to society. Some of the women, they have been gone for more than 23 years and they're just coming back. So what I do is I try to connect them with um, wraparound resources for reentry. We have a big old network of reentry around here. And I'm also a community, um, not a community help worker, I'm also, uh, the director of clemency for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And what we do is we want our whole mission is to end the incarceration of women and girls because we know from experience that prison is not a place for a girl to heal or develop in a um, healthy space. So our whole mission is to end incarceration and we raise awareness. We pick up different people cases and um, I am the face of the campaign. And we go around just everywhere we can. We start now, we started a campaign in the New England states um, because that is the least number of women that are incarcerated. And we are raising awareness because right now they are trying to build a $40 million prison there that, and they don't even have 2,500 women in prison. So we don't see the need for that. And just like the other day, I was reading about something in Alabama, they had money left over from the COVID and they want to build a prison. And I'm like, couldn't you think of something great to do with the money? But all you can see of uh, um, how to fall the press us, that's just, I just don't get it. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that that um, work shares is that I, I know a lot of times when we think about criminal justice reform, um, folks will think, you know, you have to be a lawyer or you have to have some kind of legal background, but there's so much work that can be done um, in so many ways and organizations that can be supported like the organizations that Danielle is working with. Um, and so Naila, I wanna ask you a question. I have two questions for you. Um, one is that folks wanna know when they'll be able to see the full film, when and how, so you can talk about that. But then also, um, what's your perspective on things that, you know, just given what you've learned through the making of this film, um, ways that people can be impactful in this space? What, what are you hoping people will go and do after they see the film? Well, um, as far as when the film will be available and where, uh, hopefully 2022, where, I don't know yet, <laughs> but I'll let you all know when I know, and then you can let everyone on here know, hopefully it can, uh, you know, we can just disseminate information that way. Um, as far as, I guess, what I want people to do uh, or take away from this film, um, again, to look at the human element, the family cost of long-term incarceration, to really look at someone like Danielle and imagine a prison that's filled with women just like her, so full of potential to come out and do great things, um, if only they had the opportunity. And another thing that I've taken away from this film is how important it is for those who uh, um, have been experienced, who um, have been impacted by prison, uh, by the criminal justice system like Danielle, um, like the other women that she was incarcerated with, that they lead these conversations and they lead these efforts. So um, if I was gonna tell someone, you know, what they should do to support the film or what an action item after seeing the film would be, it would be support women like Danielle. 
women and men who are coming out of um, incarceration, restarting their lives and know just what, what's needed and what it takes to get themselves back on track. And not only that, as Danielle keeps talking about mental health, work on that. If people who have been incarcerated for a very long time need these services, let's let's try and get them the services that they need. Um, of course, we all know a long time ago, prison has not been used to reform or redeem in any type of way, um, but we definitely need to bring that back into the equation so that it's not just about punishing, it's about healing um, and giving people a second chance. Um, Danielle has allowed me to read the, the commutation letter that uh, President Obama um, wrote. And one of the things that he mentions is in our constitution, we talk about giving people a second chance. And that's, I mean, if that's what we're founded on and that's what we should do. Thank you for that. And we had um, in one of the earlier symposium sessions, um, a, a gentleman who had been incarcerated and, and his sentence was um, commuted. He, we saw a clip of him reading from his, um, from his letter and it was definitely, very um, emotional for everybody, but you know, echoed that sense of giving people another chance of mercy, of potential. And, um, and so I think that's a, a really, really important point. Um, so we have still about 10 minutes left in our session. And um, though I have more questions that I can ask, I don't see any um, from the audience. And so what I would like to do, um, unless there's an objection by our organizers, is um, to allow people to see a bit more of the film. Um, so I hope folks will, will stay on to see a little bit more. The buffering issue is due to bandwidth, so we can't fix it. Um, so this would just be, you know, folks who, who are, um, have become interested enough based on this discussion to just wanna see a bit more of it because it is there prepared. So um, if we could show a little bit more, that would be great. And, um, and folks can, can stay on. But before we do that, I did wanna ask if Naila or Danielle had any um, just additional thoughts, closing um, comments that you wanted to make and you want to share before we try to show a little bit more of the film. Thank you for having us. Uh, hopefully this is the first of many, Danielle. <laughs> I want to say thank you for having me. Um, this is, I feel safe in this space and I think that we are where we need to be in this moment, but I encourage, I want to um, challenge everybody that's on the call to just reach out to somebody that's incarcerated because, I mean, get to know who they are because there are some beautiful people on the inside and very talented, very educated, very intelligent. I mean, you would be thrilled to know some of those people. And um, a lot of them who have done lengthy sentences, they don't have family anymore. They, um families are not around. They don't have support. So a letter goes a long way in the institution. I mean, you can get an email, but a letter is really personal. And, and that is really uplifting for some because we rush to mail call every evening hoping that we get a piece of mail from somebody. Yeah, and there, there's actually, there's a, um, another question in the, in the chat. So let's, let me ask that first while they're, um, while we're trying to pull up the, the film. Um, this says to Danielle, I want to know how has the how, how has COVID complicated your work? So getting out there and and um, advocating for incarcerated women, um, or maybe even advocating even harder for incarcerated women, given that in prison um, COVID has been a real challenge. But how has it impacted what you've been doing? It um, COVID has impacted in a lot of ways because we can't um, you know go places or uh, meet with people or their families uh, because a lot of time if I'm connecting with somebody, I want to meet with the family and then just give them a brief overview of some of the things that work for me. But we can't talk anymore. Uh, you know, we can't go face to face and people don't want to travel because of that. And um, it impacted in a lot of ways because now even the people that I've communicated with, sometimes they're locked down. They can't come to the phone, you know, because they had a, another COVID outbreak, so they can't use the phone. So it impacted, it impacted in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, I guess a, a lot of us are feeling that in, in lots of different spaces. There's actually another question here, um, wanting to know how can families support the work you do? And the work that the council is doing. Is there some place we can direct folks to to, to support um, that? Yes, you can go to the National Council 
Um, just look it up on the web. We can look, Google it. The National Council for Incarcerated for Formerly or Informally Incarcerated Women and Girls. Um, we had just lost, launched a national campaign where we asked a President Biden in, for his first 100 days to grant 100 women clemencies, but he didn't. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to stop asking him to do it. So uh, the more we have, the more our voice is going to be heard. Um, we walk around. We go out of town. We are doing rallies. We're bringing up people, getting their kids to come speak for them. And um, a lot of things just in the membership is only five dollars a year. So not five dollars a month, five dollars a year. So join the movement. We just had a big conference. We're going to have another conference, but we had to structure it around COVID again. And um, we for me, I want everybody to know that um, timing is everything. Because a lot of the women on the inside, they have a lot of health issues that go on dressing on top of COVID. You know, you just never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, thank you um, for that. I am um, kind of checking our, our chat situation. I don't see additional questions. And unfortunately, um, the virtual space has worked against us um, because they're unable to pull up the film. So I can't um, show those, these last few minutes and I'm sorry about that. But I do thank everyone for tuning in. Um, please be on the lookout as you know, and what, when did you say Naila to, to start looking for the film? 2022. Okay, in 2022. Um, and we will be sure, you know, I'm a proud sister, so I will be pushing the word out for sure as it comes out and we'll be sharing it um, through a lot of different avenues, including um, including the list from this conference. And you have in the chat some of the um, information for uh, the National Council um, to support Danielle's work and then also a link to the film's website. So thank you all so much for joining us. Really appreciate um, the organizers of the film and also Naila and Danielle for sharing this important work and this project. Um, best wishes to you all as you continue to work on it. And, um, and thank you all for, um, for coming. We can thank you for having us, Jelani and Holly. The pleasure was all mine. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Have you a good day. So much. Okay. And please, everyone, remember to check out the agenda for tomorrow's events. Um, we have more, more panels, more interesting discussions. And so we'd love to have you join in. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Be safe.